This is the Roots and All Budcast, presented by Sarah Wilson. Hi, and welcome to this week's Budcast. Normally, a Budcast is me talking, but this one is a little bit different because I had the enormous privilege of visiting Hampshire Carnivorous Plants to talk to Matthew Soper in his amazing nursery. I already have the next podcast scheduled for publication, but I wanted to get Matt's information out to you. So if you want to treat yourselves to some carnivorous plants before the season's over, you still just about have time to do so. The audio quality is slightly less polished than it is normally, but I hope you'll forgive us because the interview is really good. And now it's over to Matt. I'm Matthew Soper and we'll be talking about carnivorous plants here at Hampshire Carnivorous Plants. So Matt, thank you for joining me. Um, I just wondered, what are the main types of carnivorous plants that people might find for sale in the UK? The ones you usually find are the Venus flytrap, which I'm sure everyone's seen at some point or another. Um, The sundew, which is very sticky, it's an easy plant to grow. And Saracenia, which is a North American pitcher plant. Those are the main three you normally see. And what are their native habitats? Well, a lot of them actually come from the United States of America, normally the deep south where it's very swampy. That's where you'll find the North American pitcher plants and quite a number of sundews. And the Venus flytrap actually only comes from an area, a small area in North Carolina. Yeah, I was really surprised to find that out, actually. Um, What is it that's made them become carnivorous? How have they evolved that way? Is there a reason for it? Yeah, the plants... A lot of people lump them all together and think, oh, they're all carnivorous plants, it's one family, but they've actually all evolved their own separate way. A lot of them aren't related at all. Um, And the main reason why they're carnivorous and they get their nutrients from insects, or in some cases small mammals, is that they've adapted to to get their nitrogen from insects and small mammals rather than from the soil. You'll find them in very low nutrient soil. So that's why, where they grow, there's not much in the ground. And do they photosynthesize like normal plants yeah they do photosynthesize as well but this is just an added bonus for them so they can grow in areas which as i say are very low in nitrogen okay um they've got a reputation for being somewhat fussy um what are the common mistakes that people make with them um i was very fortunate as that i've been growing them since i was seven i'm 53 now and i don't find them different to other plants you normally find that garden gardeners have trouble with them because they tend to want to feed things the carnivorous plants well they've adapted to get their own nutrition from insects you're better off just using rainwater and growing them just in a a peat compost Um, if you try and feed them it it really does upset them and um, we've never had one die of starvation yet so you don't have to run around putting flies in them (laughs) if you did so so definitely don't be tempted to feed them the dead flies that you find on your windowsill well, for starters, a Venus flytrap can't eat dead flies because they need something that moves. So when they close, they can actually sense movement. Then they'll clamp down and start to feed on the insect. If you put a dead fly in there, they just close, find there's nothing moving and gradually reopen. And that does upset them. So you bet the best thing to do with them, if you really are worried about them, is pop them out in, in a July, August day and they'll catch enough for themselves. Um, and f- fertilizers, don't don't bother with those? No. Definitely not. I mean, you, you will see on the internet different special feeds for, for fly traps and Saracenia. I have not found that necessary over the years I've been growing them. And you mentioned um, rainwater. So when it, in terms of watering, how would you water them? And is, does it have to be rainwater? Rainwater is extremely important in hard water areas. Like here, we're in, we're in Hampshire here, near Winchester, and our water is really chalky and very hard. So we really do need to use, use rainwater for them. And what what it do if you don't use the rainwater? You'll find that the Venus flytrap actually kills them. So yeah, it's not good at all. Um, the other thing I think I was a bit surprised by was the amount of light that they need. Can you just talk about that? Yep, Venus flytrap, sundews and the North American pitcher plants require really high light levels and are best grown in an unheated greenhouse in a really bright sunny position, not shady at all. So full sun as much as possible. And you uh, unheated greenhouse, so they don't need too much warmth? They let their, An unheated greenhouse, a lot of people don't realise unheated greenhouse means it's not heated in the winter. In the summer months, they do get very hot. We get well up into uh, you know 40 degrees centigrade, you know, 90 Fahrenheit. In the winter, it's unheated, so we get temperatures down to about minus 8 to minus 10 centigrade on occasion. So very cold in the winter. But they do need that winter rest. Majority of them are herbaceous perennials. So when you say winter rest, 
what does that mean? Do they literally die back like a herbaceous perennial would? Exactly, just like a hosta. So lovely and colourful spring and summer. In the winter, like a hosta, they die back completely. A lot of people at this time try to bring them in the house thinking they're dying and then they perk up a bit. But I mean, if you did the same with a hosta or a daffodil, it doesn't do them any good at all. You must let them rest and die down. Okay, I wonder how many people have actually binned their Venus flytrap thinking they're, they're, they're dead. <laughs> um, so with the soil that they need... Is that a particular type of soil? Yeah, we mix our own soil here. It's quite hard to get hold of now. It's it's main the main uh, ingredient is peat, which is a bit of a no no now. A lot of garden centres have banned the sale of it. There are some alternatives which are okay, but at the moment our peat mix com one that we use is is anyone that we find is really good for them. Okay, so um, in view of the fact that it is a bit difficult to find. You, you, I know you sell that, don't you, on your website? We sell it on the website, and it. If you can get hold of peat, you can use that straight. If you can get hold of it, and it's a real shame because it is bad for the environment. But we've just found that where a lot of them grow on peat bogs, a lot of the alternatives just are not suitable, and you do lose your plants. So you've got to be careful. It's a necessary evil. Um, and and we were talking about the traps closing on certain th- uh, insects and things. I know for a fact um, that occasionally I've seen people triggering the traps just to see the mechanism work. Um, Is this something that's not advisable? Does it cause any harm to the plants? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's really hard not to because that's half the fun of the plant. I mean, when I was seven watching them close, I'd I'd seen them initially on a a natural history program and they are fascinating plants. You want to do it and you will do it. But if you can leave them alone, they get big quite quickly. And we've got some really quite large plants in the greenhouse. And the reason they're large is because they've just been left alone. And um, it doesn't take that long. If you can leave them for a few months, you'd be surprised how big they can get. And they look very impressive once yeah. you get a large, you know, five-inch pot full of them. They look really good. So I think on your website as well, you talk about repotting and you say that there's a maximum size pot that you shouldn't really go beyond. Um, is that the same for all the carnivorous plants? Yeah, for on on the whole, the Saracenia and the Venus flytrap and most of the sundews, they don't need big pots at all. They've got a very meagre root system as they try and catch most of their, plant, their, their food with their foliage. So big pots do not mean big plants with carnivorous plants. Again, if you're a seasoned gardener, you tend to want to overpot things, whereas carnivorous plants like to be quite tight in their pots. And they perform a lot better. Okay. Um, and if you did want to have a watering regime, if you were keeping them, well, either in an unheated greenhouse or um, another kind of sheltered site or, or even maybe indoors with some of them, what would the watering regime be? Do they need to sit constantly in water? Yeah, spring and summer months, stand them in a saucer or a shallow tray in about an inch of rainwater. So they've always got wet feet. Very easy. So you don't water them from the top. You just have a little look, make sure the tray's always got about an inch of rainwater in it. So not from the top, from the bottom, and always constantly sat in water. In the winter, it's best to keep them just barely damp. And the way we do this is to stand them on damp capillary matting. So they're just damp. So standing at about an inch or two centimetres of rainwater, spring and summer, and just damp during the winter months. Okay, and you mentioned, I think, um, the sundews being relatively easy to look after. What would you say is a good starter plant for people thinking of going into growing them? Uh, although the Venus flytrap is very popular because it moves by far the Drosera capensis, which is the a South African Cape sundew, this is by far the easiest one to grow. It does catch a lot of white fly. It moves, but slowly. And it's extremely easy to grow. It flowers freely and the flowers set viable seed. So you can grow them from seed yourself as well. It's a really good all-round plant and a good gateway plant to get youngsters into growing carnivorous plants. Okay. Um, So if they catch whitefly, could you conceivably use them as a pest control in, say, a, a greenhouse or if you had say fungus gnats would they would they be would they be catching enough to actually make a dent in the population yeah they really do work especially for white fly if you've got a, a small greenhouse with pelargoniums in there or fuchsias and you suffer from white fly they really do work and um i've seen some plants are literally covered in them it looks like they're being attacked by the white fly but after four or five days they slowly get absorbed into the leaves and obviously this benefits the plant as well 
So, yeah, they do work. Um, and as you say, fungus gnats are a pain. They're good for those as well. That's the sort of size insect they normally catch. They can just about manage a fly because they can curl around larger insects, but we normally find that wasps can escape from them. So fungus gnats and white fly are their, their yeah. prey. Yeah. And is there anything that you've seen them, as it were, spit out? Or is there anything the Venus fly traps don't find palatable? Yeah, I've seen wasps can get out of them. Yeah. They can really sort of push their way out. And um, on some of the North American woolen in have eaten their way out and escaped quite easily. They get out. Yeah. Um, are there any that are dangerous to pets or people? Is there any of the, say, the sticky stuff on the sun juice, is any of that toxic? No, we've been asked that quite a lot, actually, it's because the pitcher plants, where they're quite brightly coloured, a lot of people think they're poisonous. But um, none of them are poisonous, but we just don't recommend eating them, really. Just, But they're not poisonous, no. A little bird told me, actually, that I think it was the BAFTAs. Um, they used Nepenthes cups t to serve champagne in. Yeah, they might well have done, yeah. Um, the name in Southeast Asia, they're called monkey cups because actually orangutans have been known to use them as cups and scoop water up and drink out of them. I do find actually sometimes when I see them for sale, quite often those cups have got water in them. Is that another way of watering or is that just collected in there whilst it's been irrigated? Right, that the water in them, initially the plant produces itself and it's actually a digestive fluid. Now, if you've got one and you've tipped them out by accident or you buy one and the, the traps haven't got any water in them, you're better off topping them up with about two inches of rainwater in the bottom of the larger cups and in the smaller cups about half an inch or a centimetre of rainwater. Okay. And how long does it take the average, say, Venus flytrap to digest an insect? That's something the size of a house fly it takes about a week or so. It takes quite a long time. So once they close, they remain closed for a week to 10 days and then they gradually come open the fly will still be in there but squashed because it almost sucks the juice out of the fly as it were and in the wild the wind and rain would blow the fly out of the trap okay right um so we've gone through the easier one to look after what would you say is the most challenging um the, the challenging ones if you want to go a bit further with with the hobby of growing them it, it are the nepenthes or, or monkey cups we just mentioned uh, and also the helium fora sun pitchers, those two need quite high humidity and a dedicated greenhouse or a terrarium indoors with grow lights because they like really high light levels and very, very humid conditions. So they are tropical and not as easy. They just need a bit more care. Right. And you'd need to supplement the the air moisture in there as well, presumably. Yep, the moisture. And I was just going to say actually that also feeding where they're enclosed they're not catching anything at all yeah. so we do give those varieties unlike everything else a very very light feed with a, a weak or orchid feed yeah. or sb plant invigorator which we sell on the nursery yeah um with the sb plant invigorator that that's come up quite a bit actually um people recommending that do you use that as a pest control as well it has got slight trace elements which is perfect you can't overfeed the country this is why it's so good is because it, it's a it's a very good insecticide but it has a very slight amount of feed in it and when people use different mixes of orchid feed they always tend to give them too much and the funny thing with carnivorous plants especially the nepenthes if you do overfeed them they stop growing the traps because they don't bother trying to catch anything because they're getting enough nitrogen from the feed you're giving and they don't bother trying to catch flies so plant invigorator stops that and you're just giving them enough feed and keeping the plants healthy okay and it might sound like a bit of a curious question but obviously they eat most things that come within the vicinity of them but are there things that they can be plagued by as well in terms of pests yeah that's a really good question they are they're not invincible they don't catch everything green flies are pain and None of the carnivorous plants can catch green fly and all of them can be affected by green fly. So that's when you've got to watch out for. And you can use any proprietary, you know, house plant insecticide. Provado is good. Yeah. SB is good. Yeah. Um, another problem can be mealybug and scale insect. So those are the three which can be a bit of a pain. White fly, I've, I've never found, I have never found it being a problem with carnivorous plants. And the uh, sun juice do catch them so and why is it they don't eat the aphids they just can't they're they're for the saracen the traps are too big 
and the sun dews, the, the aphid get right down in the crown where there aren't any sticky tentacles. So they're really good at going. They, they, I mean, you wouldn't think they'd know, but they do. <laughs> um, I suppose the last question really is, I know that you are trialling some outdoors um, and I've also seen in various places that that is possible here in the UK. Um, I'm guessing you, you would need very specific growing conditions for them. Um, is there anywhere in the UK that you think might not be able to grow them? Um, here, here at the nursery, we're growing all varieties of Saracenia outside on a trial. And Saracenia, North American pitcher plants, can be grown anywhere outside in the UK. Wow. Uh, including seaside locations? Are they all right with the sea air? If, obviously, the real strong wind would be a bit of a problem because some of them get quite tall, but that would affect tall herbaceous plants as well. The main requirement being very acid peat soil. Okay. Um, if you're interested in growing these plants, why not pop along to the website? It's www.hansflytrap.com, where we have the widest range of carnivorous plants available in the UK. Well, a huge thank you to Matthew Soper. If you're thinking of buying some carnivorous plants, do check out his website because he is an expert on them and because he breeds from and cares for all the stock himself as an independent nursery. And as I've said in the past, we do need to support our independent British growers. If you want to find out more about Hampshire carnivorous plants and an exciting trial that Matt's conducting at the moment on growing them outdoors all year round, yes, you did hear me right, keep an eye on my YouTube channel, which is Roots and All, where I'll be uploading video we shot at the nursery as soon as we can. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. For more information, visit the Roots and All website at rootsandall.co.uk. To download more episodes, visit iTunes, your favourite podcast provider, or get them direct from our website.